Good morning. I'm so blessed to be here with you all. And what a powerful time of worship that was. I love coming on Sundays and worshiping with the whole body together. There is there's power when we lift up our voices to the one, to the true king as a diversely united body. Amen. God is doing amazing things here, and I'm energized by that. Another amazing thing that happened this week, a few of us got to be a part of some, some of the people's team went to a camp in Marengo, Ohio, just north of Columbus. We were able to lead worship there, and some of our United students were there as well, gathering along with students from all across the state of Ohio. And I grew up going to that camp. Ten years ago, I felt called to ministry at that camp. It holds a special place in my heart. And when I tell you that the next generation is coming into their own, God is calling them, God is preparing them, and I want you guys to be energized by that as well. So if you don't know about our kids program and our youth program, our peeps and our united, get to know them a little bit, say hi during meet and greet. Uh, I believe we all have a responsibility to pour into the next generation with the gifts that he has given us, even for a season. So pray how the Lord would have you do that. But I wanted to encourage you this morning. That was something I got to be a part of and I'm excited about and want you to be excited about it too. We're going to be continuing our series, Paul's letter to the Galatians, and we're breaking down this book, walking through it together, so we have a greater understanding of not just the book of Galatians, but the gospel, and applying what the Lord would have for us today. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Would you be with us as we engage with your word? Would you meet us where we are at? Would you give words? and encouragement to those who need it. And as your word is given, would you speak and direct clearly in your holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. So Pastor Petros kicked us off last week. He covered the first two chapters and emphasized that freedom through Christ is what the gospel brings. He also covered a little bit of what is happening context-wise because Paul starts the letter by defending his apostleship. He has to clarify that he is not just a random dude with a random message and a random opinion. No, he has a God-given message that has been revealed by God to him to share with the early church. And he also addresses some convolution in the church, some misunderstanding because the the Gentiles are now coming to faith, right? It used to just be the Jews, now it's the Gentiles. And the law that was followed by the Jews, some people want to carry over. And there's some specific laws in question, specifically circumcision, and they're saying, well, the Gentiles, when they come into faith, they have to be circumcised, and Paul's going, hold up, we're going to start at the beginning, we're going to lay this all out, I don't want there to be misunderstanding or question. So he begins that line of reasoning, that argument in the first two chapters. He then summarizes the gospel and transitions us to his theological argument. We're going to read that summary at the end of chapter 2, starting in verse 19. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Put simply, Christ died so we could live by grace through faith. Christ died so that we didn't have to live by the law established in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. If the law was still relevant, then Christ died for nothing. Which brings us to chapter 3. Here, Paul begins his theological reasoning, laying out how it is possible for righteousness to be achieved apart from the law. He wants to leave no room for question or misunderstanding. This is why he starts at the beginning and something familiar 
to them. He goes to scriptures that they would already know. Which brings us to our first point, the promise given to Abraham. That promise is this, that all nations would be blessed through him. We are going to be jumping into Galatians 3, chapter 6. I'll give you a second to give there, and that is where we will start the promise given to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through him. Here we go, chapter 3, verse 6. So Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announced the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. The first thing that we can pull out of this passage is just quoting that first verse, verse 6, that Abraham was deemed righteous by his faith. Something important to note along with this point is that the law was established after Abraham. Right, so Paul is quoting Genesis 15 here, and the law we see come into play in Exodus with Moses. So faith was already playing a key role in our walk with God before the law existed. Abraham was deemed righteous by his faith. God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announced it in advance to Abraham that all nations would be blessed through you. Later in the chapter, we see gospel, the gospel, what Paul calls and names and identifies as the gospel, being that all nations will be blessed through you. Also, faith in Jesus Christ. Right here, he's quoting Genesis 22. Again, making sure that there's no room for misunderstanding because they have the scriptures. They know Genesis. They know Exodus. They know that this is the promise that was given to Abraham. So he makes sure that he is, he is citing his sources. He's writing a paper, and he's putting those footnotes in there. Well, he's, he's writing a letter. But you have all written a paper, yeah? You ought to cite your sources. It's the most annoying part of a paper. But Paul does it. He does the work for us, and we're so glad that he did. This also demonstrates the significance of grace through faith. Because if the covenant and promise was given to Abraham and he was deemed righteousness by his faith. And then that covenant and that promise being that all nations would be blessed through you, that means that if the Gentiles are included in this, that the family of God just got a little bit bigger. If we have grace from God because we have faith in him, then we are a part of that family. And it's not just the Jews. He said all nations would be blessed through you. So the family of God didn't just get a little bigger. It got a heck of a lot bigger. <laughs> got a whole heck of a lot bigger. And we, we are recipients of that. You, the person sitting next to you, everyone in this room watching online, we get to be included in that. So if we are made righteous by faith, even Abraham before the law, then what was the purpose of the law? Right? If he could do this by grace through faith, even before the law was established, then what was the purpose of it to begin with? And that's what Paul addresses next. That brings us to our second point. The purpose of the law was to serve as a placeholder until Christ came. We're going to be reading kind of a dense six verses. This is going to be chapter 3, verse 16 through 22. I'll give you a second to get there. And this is where Paul really dives into the purpose of the law being that placeholder until Christ came. We ready? Okay. The promise was spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Seed means offspring in this context. Scripture does not say and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. What I mean is this, the law introduced 430 years ago does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. 
Why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. It is the law, therefore, is it opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But scripture has locked up everything under the law, everything under the control of sin, so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus might be given to those who believe. Like I said, kind of a dense six verses there, and there's a lot of information packed. Paul uses an example to make sense of it, so I will do the same. I have a friend. Her name is Ashley. I met her in college, and Ashley was born with a condition called cystic fibrosis. It affects different people in different ways, but for Ashley, it resulted in a lot of of respiratory issues, lung problems, and chronic lung disease. The longer she lived, the weaker her lungs became, and it got to the point where if she took the fullest, most exaggerated breath that she could, only 30% of the air was usable and sent to the rest of her body. Doctors shared with her that the only way forward was a double lung transplant, and if that didn't happen, she wouldn't make it past the age of 30. And as you can imagine, that lack of oxygen began to take a toll on her body. She was underweight, her bones were weaker, her muscles really weren't developed, in fact, that they were deteriorating along with her lungs. And in order to supplement the oxygen she couldn't receive naturally, she had to carry around an oxygen tank. But she's in a weaker state, so having to carry that extra burden was extra hard. And there were days I remember I would carry her books. Another friend of hers would maybe push her in a wheelchair because not only could she not lift the oxygen tank some days, she couldn't walk. It took that great of a toll on her, and it would until she received that double lung transplant, if that was possible for her. And this is what the law was to the Israelites. It was an oxygen tank that they had to carry around in order to support them in their faith until Christ could come and fully redeem them. And to use our example, until the Israelites received their new lungs. Now, praise Jesus, my friend Ashley's story gets better. On March 31st, 2018, which happened to be Easter Sunday, she woke up with a new set of lungs and truly new life. God, God only can write that story, right? On Easter Sunday is when she received her new life. I love that for her. Now that she has her new lungs, would it make sense for her once she got out of the hospital, got in the car, went home, just because she's used to it, to carry around that oxygen tank. You know, she's used to it. We still need oxygen, right? So why not use the oxygen tank so? No, it doesn't make sense because her body has new strength and was given new lungs to take full breath. It is fully functioning. And for her, it wouldn't make sense to carry around that oxygen tank anymore because she has new breath. So when Christ came and fulfilled the law on our behalf, there is no need for the law because we have new life in him. He gave the Israelites new life, new lungs, new breath in our spiritual walk with him, and now we can know him by grace through faith, and there is no need for the law. The law no longer plays a key role in God's salvation plan. It had its purpose, to act as a temporary solution to get us to the new covenant. And with the new covenant comes a new standard of living. That new standard of living is freedom by putting on Christ. And like we already talked about at the beginning of Galatians, all can receive this gift of salvation and can be made righteous by their faith in Jesus Verse 13, we're still in chapter 3. 
Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. This foreshadows Christ would come and take the burden of sin on the cross. We're in verse 14. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. It's a full circle moment. The promise given to Abraham was that all nations would be blessed through him, Jews and Gentiles alike, that Christ would come and redeem us, that we might receive the promise through faith and are in no longer need of the law. The promise came through freedom and not bondage. We're in chapter 4. We're going to jump down to verse 21. Now, if you're familiar with the story of Abraham and Sarah, you know that God promised him more offspring, more children than the stars in the sky. This was part of the covenant that he made with Abraham. And this is what Paul is talking about um, here in chapter 4, verse 21. This is talking about the covenants that were created through the children or the child that Abraham and Sarah would bring. We're going to go to verse 21 now. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and the other by a free woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as a result of the divine promise. Verse 31, therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. Here, Paul is painting a picture. Because, again, back to that story of Abraham and Sarah, God had given them the covenant promise and said, we're going to give you more children than you can count. And they're like, well, God, we don't got no kids. So they created a really solid, foolproof plan on their own, saying, hey, Sarah can't have kids, but Hagar can. So Abraham, you go be with Hagar for a second and, like, go have a kid, and then God will give us the promise. That's how that must be God's plan. So they did the thing, and God said, no, that wasn't my plan. How many know sometimes when we try and do things on our own, it always works out? Always? No, no, never. I can, I can attest personally. So God's plan was always to have the child through Sarah, through the free woman, not the slave Hagar. And this was truly to create a picture. It wasn't about appearances or because Hagar wasn't good enough. Because if you look at the lineage of Jesus, it's a little messy. It's not perfect. Hagar was good enough. It wasn't about Hagar being good enough or not being good enough. It was about what was established in freedom would bring freedom. Jesus, born of a miraculous conception then is mirrored with Abraham and Sarah, also born of a miracle because she was a barren woman and then was too old to have children. They simply mirror each other. God is creating this picture of how freedom would enter the world in the original covenant. That is freedom. And the promise would then be Jesus, fulfilling that promise and bringing freedom. It was not about appearances or that Hagar wasn't good enough. And if you're like me, you then ask, okay, well, that wasn't Hagar's fault. That wasn't Ishmael's fault, the son of Hagar. What about, what about them? God brought the promise through Sarah and their son Isaac and Abraham. What about Hagar? Which brings us to our next point. Bondage is never where he leaves us. He always makes a way. You see, God still used Hagar and Ishmael. We see this in Genesis 21, 17. This is picking up after they were sent away from Abraham. They were in the desert. They were in need. They were without direction. And they were left to their own devices. Verse 17, God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. 
You see, God still used them. And I see this also as a picture of who God is, his goodness, and his desire to save us when we are in need. Not only did he rescue them and meet them in their desperation, but he promised them greater things. And he always makes a way. And he made a way for us. It is through freedom and the promise that his gospel is possible. His plan and his purpose all along has always been this, that the gospel creates a new multi-ethnic family through Jesus Christ. All nations, all people, no one excluded, everyone included. It's why Jesus came, right? Because we saw that the law was established. It, was, it wasn't great, but it worked, kind of. Christ came so that we would all be able to experience freedom through Jesus Christ. We're going to jump back to chapter 3, verse 26. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, nor slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, his offspring, and heirs according to the promise. Why is it important? We are heirs. We are recipients of the promise. We now get to receive the righteousness given to us when we have faith in him. By his grace, we have that freedom, and no one is excluded. How is it possible? Christ fulfilled the law for us on our behalf. He took that burden on, and we receive his grace through faith in him. What does that mean for us? It means that we have a freedom that we get to live in, but some of us aren't living and walking in that freedom. It means that some of us might have oxygen tanks that we've been carrying around that we don't need to, that we need to put down because Jesus has already given us new life and new breath. Some of us have burdens and heaviness that we carry around. Some of us are holding on to sin, and we're living in that knowingly. When Christ died to free us from that, Christ has already won the victory over that. While it's not easy, God never promised things to be easy. He did promise that he made a way. He would always make a way, that he never leaves us in bondage. So why then are you carrying around your oxygen tank that you no longer need? God has given you new lungs. God has given you new life. God has given you new breath. Maybe God wants you to hike up that mountain. You can't hike up that mountain with the oxygen tank. And I mean, Mount Everest, you do need oxygen. Maybe that was a poor example. I'm running a half marathon in a few months. I might need the oxygen tank. Y'all should be fine. <laughs> but for our purposes today, you do not need the oxygen tank. I think that some of you in the room, you have been carrying around an oxygen tank when God has already won freedom for you. And I also think that there are some of you who, maybe that's not something that you walk with on a daily basis, but you are unsure and have never truly stepped out to share that freedom. Imagine that your friend is next to you carrying an oxygen tank that they don't need. They've already gotten their new lungs. They've already gotten their new life. Maybe you have friends who don't have that new life in Christ yet. We just read here, Paul laid it out really, really, really well. It's for everyone including your community, including the people that God has put in your life, in your season. So maybe it's time that we step out in faith and share that freedom with those around us. 
Paul doesn't just walk through this here. He walks through it in Romans 16. Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ in keeping with my revelation of the hidden mystery for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings so that all Gentiles might come to the obedience that come from a faith. Ephesians 6, or sorry, Ephesians 3, 6. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known. We have a responsibility and put Paul's words aside, Jesus says it himself in Matthew 28, go and make disciples of all nations. He says it in Acts 1.8 when he says, you're going to receive my spirit and you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. What that means for us, you're going to be my witnesses in Cincinnati, in northern Kentucky, in southeastern Indiana, across the nation, and to the ends of of the world. Jesus himself called us to all nations and all people. And I don't think he would have done that if the gospel wasn't meant for everybody. We saw it established with the new covenant when God promised Abraham to bless all nations through him. We are recipients of that. And not only do we have a responsibility to walk in that freedom, we have a responsibility to share that freedom with others. Let's pray. Father, we give you all glory and honor. We thank you for the freedom that you have given us to walk in. Lord, would we have the courage to walk in it? Would he have the courage to share it with one another? And as the church worldwide, would we have a greater understanding as we as we lean into your word that this gospel is for everyone, every nation, every tongue, a diversely united body, that your kingdom would be made known, that Christ may be revealed greater and greater. Lord, would you give us clarity as we do this together? Would you give us the courage to walk in your freedom? In Jesus' name, amen.